had a good day today. We had our senior adult uh, fellowship this morning for Thanksgiving, and it was a lot of fun. Everybody seemed to enjoy that, and um, so a lot of them were got their fill this morning and said, we won't see you tonight. That's all right. Amen. Some of our friends will be hopping online with us and joining us on Facebook Live tonight. We often have as many or more on there than we do in the room, and so it's a, it's a good good thing on Wednesday for people that can't get out or can't make it, you know, catch up on us that way, amen. So glad to see you tonight in the Lord's house. Continue to lift up our friends in prayer tonight. Uh, Danny Herring's doing much better. He's recovering well at home. Keep him in prayer. Kevin Todd had bypass surgery today, quadruple bypass, Anita's husband, and he is doing well. He is off the vent. He is waking up. He's probably not real happy right now, but he's doing well. And so uh, pray for him, pray for him tonight. And for Anita, destiny for their family. Um, keep them lifted up tonight. Received a call from, uh, from Barbara Peterson. Barbara's sister and husband both tested positive for COVID. And so uh, Brother Udell Hudspeth asked us to pray for them, to join them in prayer tonight. And I got her permission to share that. And so keep them lifted up. Amen. All right. Any others tonight? Any updates that you have? Ms. Francis? Wow. Harold Carpenter. All right. Let's lift him up in prayer tonight. Amen. I know there's some unspoken needs tonight. Some of you are carrying some things and some people in your heart. You're lifting them up. It's, amen. Well, stand with me tonight for a moment, if you will. Let's lift our heart to the Lord. Ask the Lord for His help and strength. And uh, just for God to give us His grace tonight as we uh, press into Him. Lord, we love you. We thank you tonight for your kindness and your love of us. We thank you for your word tonight that gives us comfort and reassurance that you're with us and for us. Lord, I ask you tonight that, Jesus, you would meet with us. And Lord, you know every need. You know every name we've called and every hand raised, who it represents and what the situation is tonight. So, Lord, we ask you to just show yourself strong for your people tonight. Lord, that we would witness you wading into the battle on their side. And, Father, that you would show your glory and your power. We ask you tonight, Lord, that you would strengthen us, Lord, for all that we face. Lord, fill us up with your spirit tonight. Give us hearts that are strong and brave to face what is before us. But we ask tonight that, Lord, you would show your grace by healing and delivering, by restoring and giving people grace and comfort, power to help, and, Lord, mercy to help and grace to help in the time of need. We pray tonight that you'd meet us around your word and anoint me to share it and open our hearts to receive it. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. And everybody said, amen. That's a... Uh, Sing together tonight. Join your heart with mine. Let's ask the Lord for His grace tonight. Amen. Sing with me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Sanctuary 
Remember this song? A vessel of honor for God. A vessel of honor for God. Sanctified, holy, sanctified, holy. soul of honor for God, a vessel of honor for God, sanctified, holy, sanctified, holy, that I might be a vessel. of honor for God, a vessel of honor for God, sanctified, holy, that I might be a vessel. Sanctified, sanctified, holy, that I might be a vessel of honor for God. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise tonight. Amen. As you're seated. Amen. You can be seated tonight. Amen. I wanted to sing that little chorus tonight because it's, uh, it comes straight from the passage we're studying tonight. If you have your Bible, we are in 2 Timothy tonight. We're going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 through the end. We're going to pick up where we left off last week in 2 Timothy, and we'll finish out the chapter tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 26 will be our text tonight. And as you're finding your place there... I'll catch you up a bit. If you've missed any night, uh, kind of let you know where we are in the study and, and what's going on. We're working our way through the book of 2 Timothy. And the main reason that I chose this book was because it's a great, um, it's a great book that teaches us how to prepare to live in a world or a culture uh, where Christians are not always favored, where we're not always um, people often disagree with us or we feel pressure. In the book of 2 Timothy, uh, there's pressure on every hand uh, against Paul and Timothy and against the church. Um, there's family pressure. We talked about that. If you were Jewish or if you were a Gentile pagan, either way, if you converted and became a Christian, there was great family pressure to abandon the Christian faith and to return either to the paganism of Rome or to the Judaism of your Jewish family. There was great pressure from your culture and your society because Christianity is this new startup religion, and so it is not respected. It is not uh, thought to be true. It's considered to be a fringe thing, a cult. And, and in the early years of the church, that was the way it was viewed, very much with suspect. There were lots of lies that were told about the church, lots of things that were said about the church that were not true in the early days. Christians were accused of believing and practicing things that would make your head spin in the early days that just were never true. Um, but that they were, these lies were spread in popular culture. So in the culture, in the society they lived in, there was this great pressure to abandon the Christian faith. By the time Paul is writing 2 Timothy, there's a third level of pressure, and it is governmental pressure. The government actually begins to bear down and persecute Christianity in an official way under Nero, the emperor. He is the one who has Peter executed. Um, he is also the one who will later, after this book, have Paul executed um, in Rome for the faith. So he is putting to death Christians, especially Christian leaders. Um, and the government is taking this hard line against the Christian faith. So will we live in a culture where we face pressure? Well, we already do. 
I don't know if it will ever become official governmental pressure to turn away from the faith or not. That is a possibility. We're not guaranteed that we will always enjoy the freedoms that we've enjoyed in our country. Men, we're not guaranteed that. It's a great gift. We enjoy that while we have it. We pray that it'll always be the case. But if in case it isn't, we prepare our hearts to be faithful to Christ. The theme of the whole book is faithfulness to Christ. Being faithful to Christ no matter what's happening, no matter the suffering, no matter what others are doing, to be faithful to Christ. So Paul writes to Timothy and urges him, be faithful, <laughs> be faithful to Christ no matter what. And we spent two weeks talking about that. In the first chapter, the first half of the first chapter, the real theme is faithfulness in the face of suffering. Say suffering. That, that whole first, first part of the chapter is, is about being faithful in the face of suffering. And Paul tells Timothy, he said, Timothy, you know, you've had, had this personal encounter with God. That should make you want to be faithful. You're, you've been, you've been saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and you know the truth. That should make you want to be faithful. Timothy, you've also, you, we have this powerful message. The only message that can bring salvation to the world is the gospel. So because the church is entrusted with the only message of salvation in the world, Christians need to be faithful. And then thirdly, Paul says, because I've given you an example. Here I am facing my own death and yet I have never backed up on being loyal to Christ. You follow my example and do the same. You be loyal just like I have been loyal to Christ. And so that's that first chapter, faithful in the face of suffering. Last week we talked about the second half of chapter 1, bleeding over into chapter 2. And the theme was faithfulness in the face of desertion. Why should I be faithful in suffering? Well, Paul answers that. And then last week Paul answers the question, why should I be faithful when others are not? being faithful why should I stand true when other people are not standing true for the cause of Christ and we talked about that last week and Paul gives this beautiful example of the, the farmer and the athlete right and the soldier and how that we have to have these qualities if we're going to stand true uh, and again Paul ties it back to his own example and he says because I have been these three things I have had the discipline of a soldier. I have had the, the, the focus of a soldier and the discipline of an athlete and the perseverance of a farmer. I have fought the fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He uses those pictures to describe himself in the end of the book. So, Timothy, again, follow my example. Follow the example of Vanessa Forrest. Follow my example. And ultimately, Timothy says, he tells Timothy, follow the example of Jesus. Remember Jesus, raised from the dead according to my gospel. Look to Jesus, remember he was faithful, he finished his course, he never backed up, you follow him and be faithful as well. Well tonight we pick up the third major section of the book, chapter 2 verse 14. And the theme tonight is faithfulness in the face of error. Error, false teaching, wrong doctrine. When, uh, w last week we talked about these two guys who abandoned the church, right? Uh, we talked about them. Uh, we talked about Figilus and Hermogenes, right? Two people we don't want to name our children after uh, because they abandoned Paul and abandoned the faith. Well, tonight we're going to pick up two more Greek names uh, in the section tonight in verse 17, Hymenaeus and Philetus, and they're a different kind of unfaithful. The first two guys are unfaithful because they leave the church, the two guys we're going to read about tonight are unfaithful because they stay in the church, but they're not faithful to the Bible. They're not faithful to preach and teach God's Word. They lead people into wrong belief. And so both of those are ways to be unfaithful. You can leave the church, and that is unfaithfulness, but you can stay in the church and be unfaithful as well, right? Sort of like in your marriage. You can end the marriage by being unfaithful, or you can stay in the marriage on paper and still be unfaithful, right? It, it, there's no guarantee there. Your presence doesn't guarantee your faithfulness. And so he writes and says, Timothy, let's talk about this. What, how do you deal with the fact that sometimes in the church, pe the unfaithful people don't leave and go back to the world. Sometimes there are unfaithful people right next to you in church. And they attend and they call themselves believers, but either their lifestyle or what they teach and believe doesn't match. How do you deal with that? What do you do about that? Let's talk about that tonight. So we will, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, we'll pick up the story. All right, you got your Bible? Let's read together. Uh, let's read verses 14 through 18 to begin with, and we'll jump in there. Verses 14 through 18. Um, 
remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word, and his people said, Amen. The first, again, Paul is going to use images or pictures, examples to try to drive his point home to Timothy, right? And so we talked about that with the farmer and the athlete and the soldier. Well, tonight he has three more pictures for him, three images that he wants to drive into his mind to communicate this idea of faithfulness in the face of false preaching and teaching. The first one is this. He said, Timothy, I want you to be an unashamed workman. An unashamed workman. We get that in verse 15. A workman who does not need to be ashamed because he knows how to rightly divide the word of truth. And we'll talk about that. So this idea of a workman, a a craftsman, uh, someone who's toiling and laboring, someone who's working on a project, and they do such a good job that at the end of it, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. They've done the job well. When they get to the end, they can look back with pride over their work and say, man, that turned out really well. I did a good job on that. Paul tells Timothy, I want you to be able to get to the end of your life and look back over your shoulder and be that kind of man who can look back over your life and say, no regrets, (laughs) not many anyway, Ah, this went well. The Lord gave me the grace and I finished strong. I did well. And that he says, that's what I want for you, a workman who doesn't have to be embarrassed over the quality of his work. That's what I want for you. He says, that's what it means uh, to be a good Christian. That's what it means to be a good pastor, Timothy. Number one, a workman who is not ashamed, an unashamed workman. And so he tells him, number one, he tells him what not to do. And again, we saw this last week. All through the book of Timothy, this is how Paul operates. Don't do this. Instead, do this. Right? We saw it last week. He did that. These are the things to avoid. These are the things to pick up. He does it again right here in this passage. He says, Timothy, number one, let's talk about what not to do to do. He urges Timothy not to get pulled into the foolish issues or false doctrines based on speculation or people's private revelations that contradict the Bible. If a preacher or teacher does so, it will cause great harm. Look at verse 14. Do not strive about words to no profit. Why? To the ruin of the hearers. Timothy, if you get involved in the stuff that's not in the center of the word, it will do harm to your hearers. It will ruin the people who sit under your ministry. Verse 16, shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Oh, wow. So you will destroy the hearers. And number two, if if they believe wrongly, they will behave wrongly, and false teaching leads to ungodly living. You see the link there? If you teach wrong, people will live wrong. If you get stuck on this stuff, it will lead to ungodliness. People will not live the way they ought to live. And I want to tell you, if there is a crisis in the American church today, it's that one. Because people won't rightly preach the book. People don't rightly live the book. Uh, You can't get a clear read from the referee up front on where the lines are then when you're living life, you don't know if you're in bounds or out of bounds when you're doing something because you can't get the ref to step up with a rule book and go, the line is here and here, stay in it and blow the whistle when you don't. Preachers and teachers who won't just preach the truth do a disservice to everyone. They're like a ref who won't throw the flag or blow the whistle. Ah, it's close. I think you might be in. I don't know, though. Well, get off the field. (laughs) we need somebody out there with eyeballs who can tell us is it in bounds or out of bounds is it fair is it foul call a straight game man get some glasses right Um, that's what we need from pastors call a fair game be true to the word don't pull any punches just tell us is it in bounds or out of bounds what does the Lord say what does the Bible say that's what people want to know and so he says if you don't do that Timothy you do a disservice you'll ruin your hearers and you will increase ungodliness in your church and community verse 23 but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing they will generate strife foolish and ignorant disputes Timothy, if you just argue about everything, 
All you'll do is keep the church stirred up all the time in turmoil. There are some preachers that thrive on controversy. There's some people that thrive on controversy. There's some people that love shock statements and things that just get everybody all riled up and they do that. It's, it's, it's a tactic. Uh, and maybe it's an attention getter. I don't know. But I want to tell you, if we're not careful, uh, some preachers, all they want to do is be headline grabbers and say things in such a way that attract attention, but they don't ever really anchor it in the Word of God. All they do is generate strife. They just keep stuff stirred up all the time. That isn't helpful. It isn't helpful. It doesn't, it doesn't bless the body of Christ. Paul says, Timothy, don't do that. <laughs> these are the things not to do, right? Um, don't get caught up in these vain arguments. As a pastor, Facebook is always a dangerous thing for me, especially when people talk about theology and Bible questions and, and those kinds of things on there. If I wanted to, I could spend all day, every day, fighting with people on Facebook about dumb things they say about the Christian faith. I could do that all day, every day, if I let myself. I don't let myself. <laughs> um, it, there's no point in that. And that's the very kind of thing Paul is warning Timothy not to do. Timothy, don't get sucked into it. And I want to tell you tonight as a Christian, don't you get sucked into it either. Because most of the time, the people that you're arguing with uh, you're not going to change their mind. Uh, they're already set on what they believe. You're wasting your breath. And he who argues with a fool proves there are two. <laughs> Jesus said something about not casting your pearls before swine. There are some people who ask you a question because they honestly want to know the answer and, and they want guidance in the Word. Those are the kind of people you want to spend your time investing in. There are other people who the only reason they ask you is because they already suspect they disagree with you and they can't wait for the opportunity to argue with you about it. You don't have time for that. Amen. And if you do have time for that, come see me. I've got some better ways you can spend your time serving the Forest Hill Church. I can put you to work. Amen. We can find you something to do that's a lot more productive than that because that is not productive in the end of the day. Um, how many people have you ever really changed by arguing with them on social media? Anybody got a convert yet? Me neither. Why do we do it? Uh, why do we do it? So Paul tells Timothy, just stop. Just don't get sucked in. That's what not to do. Then he tells him who not to follow. Now this is also important. And again, especially when we have a social media thing called Twitter where we literally follow people, right? He tells them who not to follow. And he gives the example of these two men that I mentioned a moment ago, Philetus and Hymenaeus. These two men proved to be unfaithful to Christ, not by leaving the church like Figilus and Hermogenes. These guys were unfaithful by staying in the church and preaching things that weren't true. He says in verse 17, Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the faith saying that the resurrection is already past and they overthrow the faith of some. Very dangerous. Paul warns about these false teachers. Number one, he says they stray from the truth. You see it, verse 18? He says in verse 18, he said, they have strayed concerning the truth. Uh, so they get off in some way. There is a difference in my mind between error and heresy. Those are two words we often use synonymously but they don't mean exactly the same thing someone can be guilty of error and not be guilty of heresy let me explain it like this I tell people when they come through the new members class at the Forest Hill Church there are two kinds of lines that we draw as a church around what we believe there are some lines we draw in pencil and there are some lines we draw in ink what I mean by that is simply this there are some things that you must believe in order to be a Christian and if you do not believe those things, then however warm you may be toward the Christian faith or however you, much you may personally like Jesus or admire him, you are not and cannot be a Christian if you do not believe certain things. There are some tenets of the faith that are just not negotiable. You must believe them in order to be a Christian. And if you don't believe them, you are not a Christian. Those are lines we draw in ink, right? If you're outside of the boundaries of those lines, you are in heresy. And the belief of the church has always been if you're in heresy, you're not saved. You're not part of the church. You're not on your way to heaven. You believe so wrongly that you can't have saving faith because you don't believe the gospel. 
However, there are also lines that churches draw in pencil. What do you mean, Pastor? There are some things that good Christians disagree about, but they're still good Christians. There are sometimes that there are things the Scripture is so clear about, there's no room for debate or, or difference of opinion. The Bible says it, and that's the end of it. There are a few topics in this book, believe it or not, though, that are not that clear. And good Christians take different positions on them because we seem to find Bible verses that point different ways about it. And when we weigh those verses and we try to interpret all that the Bible says about a subject, sometimes good Christians come to different conclusions. And so I say there are lines we draw in pencil, and we can be good Christians and disagree about where those boundary lines ought to be. There are some Christians that are adamant about the fact that Jesus is coming and the rapture is going to come before the tribulation begins. There are other Christians that are equally adamant and say, no, the, the rapture happens in the middle of the tribulation at the three and a half year mark. There are other Christians that are adamant about the fact that the rapture takes place at the end of the tribulation and that the rapture and the second coming are the same event. And they can all stack up about an equal number of Bible verses and argue their point at you. They're pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. What is the church of God? The church of God is pan-trib. We believe it's all going to pan out like God wants it to. And we'll figure out at the end which one was right. <laughs> what do you mean? What is the church of God position? We don't have one. It's a line that's drawn in pencil. So we don't take a position on it. Because good Christians can disagree about it and still be good Christians. And it ought not be the kind of thing that you can or cannot attend our church because you disagree with us about that. That's a line in pencil. Now, somebody is right and somebody is wrong, right? I mean, the rapture's only happening at one of those places. It's not happening at all three. <laughs> somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Somebody's in error, amen, and somebody's got it right, maybe. There's truth and there's error, but that's not the same as heresy. Error is, I believe in a mid-trib rapture and I'm wrong. I end up being wrong. Well, that's not, that's not a heaven or hell issue. That's not going to cost me my salvation if I'm wrong about that. Heresy is when I believe wrongly about one of those ink lines, one of the lines around the Christian faith that we draw in ink, something I must believe in order to be a Christian. Well, Pastor, what are those must-believe things? Well, basically, they're the things that we talk about in the Apostles' Creed. They're the things that, the fundamentals that we talk about um, in the evangelical movement. Um, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Can't just believe Jesus is a good man. Can't just believe he was a prophet. Can't just believe he was a great teacher. Can't just believe he's a miracle worker. You must believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. If you don't believe that, whatever you may or may not be, you are not a Christian. Because Christians believe Jesus was God. I, I, I love the interview I saw with Rick Warren one night. Someone, uh, he was, they were asking him, it was a Jew, a Muslim, and Rick Warren was representing the Christian. And they said, well, don't Jews and Muslims and Christians all worship the same God? And Rick Warren's answer was so insightful, and he said, no. And they said, well, yeah, they all worship the God of Abraham. The other guys are trying to make peace and not be controversial. And Yeah, we all worship the same God. And Rick Warren said, no, we don't worship the same God. And they said, what do you mean we all worship the God of Abraham? And Rick said, let me clear it up for you real quick. We believe that God became human, died, and rose on the third day. Do you believe that? No. Well, then we don't worship the same God. <laughs> Pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus is always the dividing line. Can I just tell you that? Jesus is always the dividing line. Anything that we get right or wrong centers back on him. And if you get it right about Jesus, those are the ink lines. If you get it wrong about Jesus, those are the ink lines. If you notice what Paul says here, he talks about these guys. He says, they're preaching that the resurrection has already happened. Well, that's heresy. That's wrong. It's messing with people's belief. If you do not believe Jesus is the Son of God who died and rose from the dead, if you don't believe Jesus is born of a virgin, if you don't believe that we're saved by grace through faith, not by our own good works, if you don't believe uh, those things, if you don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, if you don't believe that he's coming again in the body and he's literally going to return to the earth, if you don't believe these basic things about Jesus, you're not a Christian. You may be warm toward the faith, but you're not a Christian. You're not in, you may be near the kingdom, but you're not in the kingdom until you believe those things savingly. And so Paul writes and says, listen, these teachers stray from the truth, and they damage their hearers. We just read it, uh, verse 14. 
He says in verse 14, he says, they ruin their hearers. Verse 18, he says, they overthrow the faith of some. There's some people who got so messed up by a bad preacher or teacher, they walked out of the church and never returned. That's happened to people. People have gotten so messed up and burned by false teachers and preachers, they just walked away from the faith. They threw the baby out with the bathwater and said, man, if that's representative of what it's about, I don't want any part of it. I don't want anything to do with it. And they just threw up their hands and walked away. And that is so sad. And whatever pastor and teacher did that will be accountable for that before the Lord on the day of judgment. That's a fearful thing. And so they do that. They quit. But the, the dangerous thing is verse 17. He says, and their message will spread like cancer. The problem is they're wrong, but they're popular. They don't have the truth, but it spreads like wildfire. Have you ever noticed that? A friend of mine used to say, you know, um, a lie will circle the globe while the truth is still trying to get its shoes laced up. <laughs> a lie will get there faster, but when the truth gets there, it'll have something to stand on, though. But it's amazing to me how when you look at popular culture, think people who preach wrong doctrine often have the greater following than people who are faithful and preach the truth. It's one of the scary things. The Bible said it would be so. The Word warns us. He says their teaching will spread like cancer. False doctrine spreads. It grows. It has a way of taking root in popularity. I think there's a reason for that. If you remember the list in Galatians chapter 5 when it talks about the works of the flesh, you know, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, heresy is one of the things on that list. Heresy. You say wait a minute, Thought wrong doctrine is like comes from my flesh? Yes. You know why? We love for people to preach things to us that allow us to stay right where we are and do whatever we want. And so whenever we find someone who scratches us just right and tells us how wonderful we are and doesn't challenge us and tell us we need to change anything about ourselves and they can prop it up with a Bible verse or two, we're just like, man, yeah, He's such an encouraging, motivational preacher. I want to go there, right? And we go and we count. People do that. Rather than going somewhere where the Word of God is going to address them, they're going to be challenged, they're going to be called to step up to the plate and be different. So Paul says, let me tell you what not to do. Don't get pulled into foolish arguments. Let me tell you who not to follow. Don't follow these slick people who stray from the faith and twist the message and damage their hearers and gather large people around them by telling them just what they want to hear. Paul says, stay away from that and stay away from those kinds of people. What do you do instead, Timothy? He says, here's what you do. Verse 15 is the key. Verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The King James says, study to show thyself approved. Now, when we think about that word study, the way we use the word study today means open a book and put your nose in it, right? Study to show yourself approved. And there's nothing wrong with reading the verse that way. We, Timothy is supposed to study the Bible. But the word study there is not the word study like go crack a book and put your nose in it. The word study there is more, it's a deeper word than that. It's the idea of be diligent, be eager, put in the hard work required, study in other words, you study on something if you really want to accomplish it. If you want to open a business, you study on that. <laughs> if you want to learn how to pick up a new craft or skill, you study on it. Uh, you do all the hard work necessary. You do the research. You do the practice. You do everything you have to do to get good at it. Anybody who's a deer hunter knows what I mean. You study on it. You find out upwind, downwind. You find out how to camouflage your scent. You find out how to camouflage yourself. You do everything you can do. You study on it. You study to show yourself. That's the word here. Be diligent. Put time, effort, energy into it. Timothy, he says, do all that you can. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Timothy, if you don't want to be ashamed, if you want to be a good pastor, Timothy, if you want to be a solid Christian, he says, let me tell you the one key skill you've got to master rightly dividing the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word rightly divide is, is a Greek word, ortho to munta. Ortho, we know what that word is, orthopedic, orthodontist. Ortho means something's crooked and needs to be made straight, right? Your back, your leg, your teeth. <laughs> ortho, ortho means right <laughs> or straight. <laughs> it's this idea of taking something crooked and making it straight. That's what the word here is, ortho uh, tamunto. Tamunto is to cut. 
In other words, cut it straight. That's literally what the word means. Rightly divide the word. Cut it straight. My mom could take a pair of scissors and a bolt of fabric, and without looking or without measuring, she could run the scissors right up through it and cut a straight line. It's beautiful. Mine looked like I was chasing a snake when I cut a piece of fabric, right? My mom can rightly divide with a pair of scissors. She can ortho to munto. She can cut it straight. That's what the word means. And Paul tells Timothy, when you're preaching the Bible, cut it straight. The word is also used about uh, plowing a row in a field. Uh, if you plow a row, if you've ever done a garden, you want the row to be straight, right? Plow it straight. The way you do that, you fix your eye on something at the end and you walk straight toward it. If you look around and check it every five minutes, it won't be straight. You fix your eyes and you walk and you cut it straight. It's the idea of building a road. It's the same idea. You build it straight. You want it straight and level. That's the word. Timothy, when you preach the Bible, cut it straight. You want a straight path. You want a straight row. You want a clean cut. You want people, you want to be very clear about what you're teaching and preaching. You want people to know exactly where the boundary lines are. What does it say? What does it not? What does it mean? What does it matter? Be clear when you preach, Timothy. If there's mist in the pulpit, there is fog in the pew. Be as clear as you can up here because it matters to people. It matters. Rightly divide the word. There's a couple things we have to watch out for. Avoid, if you're going to rightly divide God's word, number one, avoid proof texting. You can string a bunch of Bible verses together that you find all over the book and make the Bible say anything you want it to say. And this is what most people do. They decide what they believe, and then they go look for a verse to support it. Well, if you want to do that, you can do anything. You can believe anything you want to if you're just going to proof text your way through. That is not rightly dividing the Word of God. We don't go to the book deductively and say, this is what I believe, now let me go find proof. We go to the Bible inductively. I want to read the book and see what it says, and I'm not going to twist it to fit my belief system. I'm going to let the book form me to believe what it says. Inductively, I'm going to let it teach me and form my heart in its own categories. Avoid proof texting. Let the book speak for itself. Number two, avoid private interpretations. Have you ever been to one of those group meetings where people sit around and they read a verse and they say, what does this verse mean to you? With all due respect... I wouldn't give you two hairs off of a camel for what the verse means to you. I don't care what the verse means to you or what the verse means to me. I want to know what the verse means. Do you hear me? The Bible says Scripture is of no private interpretation. It means what it means. And let's figure that out. And then let's apply it to our lives and figure out how we do that. But it means what it means. People have the same problem with the Bible that they have with the Constitution. There's two ways to read the United States Constitution. Original intent or it has a rubber nose and I can twist it to say whatever I think it ought to say. You hear me? And the same kind of logic that people apply to the U.S. Constitution, they apply to the Bible. And we use the same terms for them, liberal or conservative. A conservative is someone who looks at the Constitution and says, there is no right in the Constitution to all these new things you found in the last 50 years. The original writers of the Constitution would never have dreamed that you would twist the passage and make it say that. The Constitution means whatever the original writers intended it to mean. If we don't like that, we can change that, abandon that, do something about that, but it means what it means. We don't go find new meaning in it or fill it with our own meaning. The same is true for the Bible. What does the passage mean? When Paul wrote it, what did it mean to the original hearers? That's what it still means today. Now, I may apply that differently in my life than they did because of the situation difference, but you've got to get the principle right before you can figure out the application. But it doesn't just mean whatever I want it to mean. It doesn't mean what I feel that it means. So no proof texting and no private interpretations. And number three, for heaven's sakes, avoid these prophetic typologies where people just come in and say, well, you know, somewhere in some place uh, this is a symbol for this. And so every time they see that in the Bible, they apply that. Oh, this is a symbol for this over here. I've heard people take clear teachings of Scripture and just gut them by doing foolish stuff like that to them. I won't call his name, but my wife and I uh, heard, sat under a preacher one time who had a very popular television ministry, and, and he, would, he would always point out these patterns and things like that in the Bible and 
patterns and numbers and all this stuff, and you walked away looking at your Bible going, I would never see that or get that out of the passage. I don't see how anybody could see or get that out of that. And he's like, well, well, I studied here and there and this and that, and you have to know all these things. or otherwise." And I'm, and I'm scratching my head going, well, Lord, what would we do without you? And what did the church do for 2,000 years before you showed up? Was everybody wrong before you? Whenever someone comes with a new revelation, let this word ring in your ears. Heresy. Heresy is always a new take. We don't need a new take. We need to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. God gave us the message like he wanted it, and he wants it like he gave it to us. Leave it alone. Faithfully transmit it to the next generation. Don't mess with it. Amen? It's like the recipe for Coca-Cola. When they messed with it, we quit drinking it, right? Right? Then they had to come back with the classic version that everybody wanted to drink. That's not classic. It's the real deal. All that other stuff was garbage. I want Christianity classic. <laughs> I want what the book says. Teach me the word of God. Amen. And so Paul tells Timothy, number one, you want to be a, serve, you want to be a, a workman who is not ashamed on the day Jesus comes. And the only way to not be embarrassed as a Christian or a pastor is if you know how to cut it straight when it comes to the Bible. You can rightly divide God's word. You don't proof text. You don't, what does it mean to me? You study and find out what it really means and says. And you don't get caught up in all of these fly-by-night symbologies that fly in the face of just the clear meaning of the passage. The simplest meaning is the correct meaning most of the time. Do you hear me? The plain reading of the text is usually right unless there's something in the text to tip you off that it's being symbolic or it intends to be interpreted in some different way. The text will usually alert you to that, right? Um, when you read the book of Daniel and you read about beasts with horns and crowns and all that, and you think, man, what is Daniel taking, right? Well, then you flip the page and you realize the angel explains it. And he says, these are kingdoms and nations and rulers. And you're like, oh, Daniel wasn't on LSD, right? He wasn't seeing wild animals running around his bedroom. No, no. This is a vision that has a meaning. But the Bible interprets itself. It'll tell you when it's doing that. But don't let somebody take a plain passage and try to roll one over on you by applying some symbolism that shouldn't be applied. That is misinterpreting the text, and it is not rightly dividing the word. Timothy, you want to be a workman who's not ashamed. Number two, Timothy, you want to be a clean vessel. Look at verse 19. This is the second thing. Remember we said a moment ago that wrong teaching leads to wrong living. False doctrine leads to false living. Believing wrong leads to living wrong. Look at verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Let's stop right there. One of the ways you can spot false doctrine is this. There's two ways, key ways. Number one, does it line up with the Bible or not? That's, that is the way to tell. If you're still in doubt, answer this question. What kind of fruit does that teaching produce? Look at the lives of the people who believe it. Does believing it draw them closer to God and make them live more holy, godly lives? Or does believing that somehow mess up the way they live and cause them to compromise or not behave in a way that a Christian ought to behave? If it leads to wrong behavior, it is a wrong belief. Because my behavior is motivated by my beliefs. I, I act in concert with what I believe. If I believe this chair will hold me up, I'll sit in it. If I don't, I won't. We, we act in concert with our beliefs. And if you believe wrongly, you will live wrongly. And it's very dangerous. So the Lord, here's the foundational seal. Uh, the, the, the foundation of God stands firm. The Lord knows those who are his. But hear this. Everyone who names the name of Christ should depart from iniquity. If I really belong to God and I really believe God's word, I ought to be departing from my old life of sin he says be a clean vessel keep going verse 20 but in a great house are there not only vessels there are not only vessels of gold and silver but also of wood and clay some for honor and some for dishonor therefore if anyone cleanses himself from the latter 
he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. There's the chorus we sang a moment ago. False teaching leads to false living. Wrong belief leads to wrong behavior. We don't just believe the truth, we live the truth or not. We can either be a fine china plate or we can be a paper plate. We can be a crystal goblet or a red solo cup. It's up to us. One is kept and brought out time after time. The other one is used and then discarded. And Paul warns us that these are options for us um, in the house of God. The bottom line is this. God's going to get glory out of your life one way or the other. Do you realize that? People will say, well, I'm not going to live for the glory of God. Everyone in the end lives for the glory of God. You can't escape that. Oh, no, I'm going to be a sinner and I'm going to run as far as I can and I'm not going to glorify God. Yes, you will. Because at the end, you will stand before God and he will judge you for having been disobedient to his word and he will banish you from his presence and you will spend eternity in a place called hell and your life will have proven to everyone looking on in that moment that God is just and God is holy and when you step away from him you will have glorified God by exalting his justice and his righteousness and his wrath against sinners. You still glorified God in the end. And you were a red solo cup that did bring glory to God and got crumpled up and cast away. Because that's all the glory you brought him. There's another option if you don't want to be a red solo cup that gets crumpled and cast away. Paul says you can be a vessel of honor for God. You can bring glory and honor to God by cleansing yourself from this sinful world, by surrendering and submitting yourself to God, by believing the gospel and following and obeying the truth, and your life can be something that God fills and uses again and again and again for his glory. You can be a vessel of honor. You can be the fine china that gets brought out on the holidays. You can, you can be something that is kept and passed down from generation to generation. You can be useful. You can be honorable. Or you cannot be. But in a house, there are both kinds of vessels. In your house, you've got paper plates and good china. Guess what? So does God. And it's up to you which one you are. I don't want to be a paper plate. I want to be fine china. Paul says, then cleanse your life. Stop living and acting like the world. Believe the gospel. Allow God to sanctify your life, cleanse you, make you like Christ, make you useful for kingdom service, and you will be a vessel of honor that brings glory to God again and again. How do we do that? Well, again, Paul says, well, there's some things you need to avoid, and there's some things you need to embrace. He does it through the whole book. Here you go. Run from and run after. Verse 19, depart from iniquity. Verse 22, flee youthful lust, he says. Verse 22, flee youthful lust, right? Then he says there are some things you ought to run after. Run after. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those, all those who have a pure heart. Verse 22. So we run from some things. We run from iniquity, which is crookedness, sinfulness. We run from youthful lusts. That's an interesting word. The word lust, we think of in our day, lust is just something sexual in nature. The Greek word is stronger than that. It has a bigger pool of meaning than that. It just, the word here just means strong desire. The strong desires of youth. You remember when you were 17, all your desires were strong desires, right? Then you got tired. <laughs> but when you're young, all your desires are strong desires. Your desires for everything. And that's the word. Uh, he says, avoid these strong desires you had when you were young and stupid and did things you shouldn't do. Paul says, all of that, that whole ball of wax, just don't give into that. Flee from that. Run away from that, Timothy. Why is he telling Timothy to flee youthful lust? Timothy's the youngest pastor in the New Testament. He is still a young man. He still leans toward this. this. He's still young enough and energetic enough that he could get pulled into this, Right? I had an uncle who always thought he was young and energetic enough, right to the end, amen? Some people never outgrow that, I guess. Here he is. Paul says, flee youthful lust. The word lust here 
reverse a sexual sin. It can also mean coveting what belongs to someone else, a strong desire for somebody else's possession, wanting what isn't yours, jealousy. It can be desiring what God calls evil. It can be reaching after what is forbidden and off limits for you according to God's word. The word is a catch-all for every bit of that, okay? So Paul says, run from that. And then he says, run after righteousness, faith, love, and peace. But then he says, with all those who follow Christ with a pure heart. Verse 22, with all those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I love that, a pure heart. And then at the top of it, he said, remember, a vessel of honor, sanctified, holy. Put those two things together. Sanctified, holy, a pure heart. Those are the same thing. Those things mean the same. To be sanctified and holy means your heart is pure. Let me talk about this a second before we go. To be a Christian who is sanctified does not mean you're sinlessly perfect, you're an angel, and you never make a mistake. That's not what sanctified means. What sanctified does mean is you have a pure heart. God has cleansed the motive of your heart. The motive that drives your behavior has been cleansed. You do what you do because your heart has been filled with love for God and love for neighbor. And love is the driving motivation of your actions now. That's what it means to be sanctified. That just means to have a pure heart. My heart can be pure, and yet sometimes I still don't bat a thousand with my behavior. You say, Pastor, how can that be? If your heart's pure, how can you still do something that's, that, that's technically not right or wrong? Well, several reasons. Sometimes it's infirmity. You know, there are blind spots in me that I don't even see that other people see rather clearly. There are things I don't know about myself, and there are things you don't know about yourself. As well as you know yourself, there are things you don't know about you. There are things the people close to you know about you that you don't know about you. Some of them are things they'll never tell you. Some of them are things they tried to tell you and you still deny to this day. <laughs> oh, no, that's not true. It is. Yeah. There are blind spots in my life. And sometimes I do things just out of a blind spot because I can't see it. it it's not, it's not, I'm not conscious of it. The Holy Spirit hasn't brought it out of the dark into the light. I haven't seen it yet. He hasn't peeled back the onion far enough to get to that in me yet. I'm not aware of it. You may be aware of it, but I may not be. And so I could be doing something that technically is wrong, and yet my heart could still be pure because it's a blind spot for me. Now, eventually, the Holy Spirit, I believe, will get to that if I walk with Christ long enough. Well, Pastor, what about the stuff he doesn't get to? Well, the blood of Jesus covers that, and he'll fix that when I get to heaven. That's what grace is for. Thank God for grace. There are also times that I make a wrong decision because I don't have all the information. You ever made a decision on incomplete information, but it was all you had to go on at the time? And then you get a little further down the road and realize you were wrong. Was that wrong decision sin? Well, I don't know. Was it? If you did somebody wrong because of it, I guess it was. But was your motivation to do wrong? No. Your heart was pure, even though your action may have missed the mark. What Paul is calling us to is not perfect performance. We don't reach that this side of heaven. Not ever. But what Paul is challenging us to is purity of heart. I think that's what Jesus calls us to as well. Remember, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. He didn't say blessed are the perfect in performance. <laughs> he said blessed are the pure in heart. We won't hit perfect in performance this side of heaven. We can be pure in heart. We can have a heart that's loyally devoted to God. Let me give one more stab at explaining it to you. There are quite a few things that I get wrong as a husband, and yet none of them, thankfully, are things that are deal breakers for my wife. Not my pile of dirty clothes that sits in the chair in our bedroom too long. Not the fact that Monday I forgot it was garbage day and now there's way too much garbage to wait till Thursday piled up in that little garbage can. God bless you. Uh, none of those things are deal breakers for her. Are they imperfections on my part? Absolutely. But they're not deal breakers because I don't do them out of any attempt of being disloyal or hurtful toward her. How many of those things will Shay tolerate? Well, probably more than I want to push the button on. But, uh, but how much unfaithfulness do you think she would tolerate? 
Considering she's a crackerjack shot from 100 yards, I don't ever plan to find out. Amen? No, for better reasons than that, I plan to never find out. She wouldn't tolerate any unfaithfulness in me. Do you see the difference? There's a difference between a failure and being unfaithful in your heart. What we are called to as Christians is not perfect performance. But we, what we are called to in Scripture is faithfulness to Christ. Loyalty to Christ. A heart that is surrendered. A heart that is totally devoted to Him. A heart that isn't divided and 50% Jesus and 50% the world or 60-40 or even 90-10. But wholly devoted to Jesus even though my performance isn't always measuring up. My heart is always, I love you. I want to please you. I want to serve you. I'm yours. And, and I'm, I'm learning how to do this better. And when I fall down, I'm going to repent and fix it and get up and go after it again. I'm going to flee the right things and I'm going to run after the right things, Jesus, by your grace. Paul says, be a clean vessel. Say a clean vessel. One more. I've got to let you out. It's 730. I've got to get you out of here. One more. Number three, Paul says, be a gentle servant. Be a gentle servant. Verse 23, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be gentle to all. Able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Be gentle. Be humble, be patient, Paul says to Timothy. He says, if you want to be a, a servant of the Lord, do not quarrel. Do not argue with people. Boy, that one's hard. Especially when we're right, right? Shay and I, um, one of our shows that we loved to watch uh, was we were Downton Abbey fans when that series was going on PBS. And one of my favorite characters was the Dowager Countess, the old woman on there. And uh, my favorite line, I think, of hers all the way through the series was when she was having a heated argument with someone. And they said, um, said oh, don't fight about it, Mama. And she said, I do not fight. I merely explain why I am correct. <laughs> we do that, don't we? We don't fight. We just explain why we're right. My other favorite line of hers is someone said, I don't see a thing in the world wrong with that. And she said, well, just because you can't see it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it, only that you can't see it. <laughs> That's very true, by the way, sometimes. Paul tells Timothy, avoid the temptation to explain why you're right all the time. Don't quarrel. Don't do it. Don't argue. Don't fight. Instead, what do you do, Timothy? Be able to teach and be willing to humbly correct, but don't just get in endless debate and fight with someone. Don't do it. Why not? Because it does no good. Because here's what Paul understands about false doctrine. People who believe false teaching, listen to me, people who believe false teaching are in the grip of the enemy. They are under the influence of an evil spirit. The enemy has cast his spell on them. They are in the web of this false belief and it has clouded their heart and their mind. And it's not enough just to be able to explain why you're right. Because it isn't just an intellectual problem. It is a spiritual problem. They believe this false doctrine because it's meeting some kind of need in their life. And you're trying to talk them out of this teaching and you can't just change their head about it. You've got to get to their heart and realize why has this got such a grip on them? Why do people end up in these cults to begin with? Because cults offer people something that they're not finding anywhere else. Acceptance, love, a place to belong. Maybe a place to be somebody and be a leader and exert influence and authority. Maybe it's fear-based and they're telling them, if you get out of here, if you leave this group, you're going to hell. You won't ever be able to make it to heaven if you're not part of this group because we're the only ones going. You've got to understand that when people are in the grip of false teaching, it's not enough to talk to their head. Their heart is involved. This is meeting some kind of need in their life. And you've got to address both of those things to ever see them walk out of that and walk into the truth and the freedom of Christ. So what does Paul say? Be, willing to, be able to teach, 
clearly explain what God's Word says. Be willing to correct if you see any of your people beginning to veer over into false teaching. Timothy, go. Have the conversation. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Red flag. Looks to me like you're getting... No, no, no. Let's, let's come back. These are... I'm the shepherd and you're the sheep. And the, sometimes the shepherd has to take that long, crooky stick and go, no, 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 Fluffy, back over here. We don't want to get over there, right? You, you, someone has to pull us back. Somebody has to take the word and pull us back. But Paul says this also. He says, listen, but you've got to understand this is a spiritual battle. He said, so teach, correct, be humble, be gentle, don't argue, don't fight. Why? He says, verse 25, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? The problem isn't just in their head. The problem is people who are involved in, in error and false teaching and heresy, and they get pulled in and they get in the grip of the evil one, and he spins a web in their mind, and it's hard to tangle, untangle that and to get free from that. I know that. I know that from my own experience. Um, there was a season in my early Christian life when I was so wrapped up in legalism from uh, a group of, 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 of believers who had led me wrong on some things. And... Um, I don't believe they meant to. I don't believe their motive was ill at all, but they were confused, as Pastor Q would say, about some things. And, and I got wrapped up in that for a season. And I remember friends of mine who knew and understood the Bible better would try to talk me through, and it would do no good because I was so convinced that these people were right and, 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 and I was listening to them. And finally, I remember in desperation one night, I had... This guy's literature and this guy's literature and what this person said about it and what this person said about it. And I finally, I remember taking my Bible. I was 14 years old. And I remember slamming my Bible down on top of it and saying these words. Lord, I don't care who's right. I just want to know what the truth is. And if you will show me the truth, if I have to change everything I've ever believed, I will follow you and I will follow the truth. And that night, it was like some chains broke off of my heart and my life. And I did shift my belief system about 90 degrees on a few things not on everything but on a couple key things the Lord shifted my heart that night and I was able to open the same book that I had been reading for two years and I was able to see truth that I had not been able to see before because other people had tried to steer me away from it or reinterpret it or explain it away and all of a sudden when the Holy Spirit turned on the light switch and I was able just to read the book without somebody else in my ear and allow the Holy Spirit to bring clarity, I was able to see this is what the Bible says and walk my way out and get to a safer church that had more solid biblical preaching and teaching. My point is this. It wasn't just in my mind. It had a grip on me all the way around. And all I can explain to you that happened that night was somehow the Holy Spirit took the Word of God and broke me loose and got me unstuck from it and delivered me and I had this moment I was able to see straight. That's what Paul says has to happen. If someone's in sin or if someone's in false teaching, Paul says pray for them that God will grant them repentance. Pr repentance means to change your mind. Pray that God will grant them a change of mind. Pray that God will help them know the truth. Pray that God will help them escape from the snare, the trap of the enemy. Pray that God will rescue them from the devil who's taken them captive to do his will. So whenever we preach God's word and teach God's word, we're in partnership with the Holy Spirit. We trust God to use his word to perform a miracle. People trapped in sin and deception or both require God's intervention. We must trust the Holy Spirit to work with us and when we present the Word of God. The pastor is Christ's servant, but Christ is the only Savior. He's the only one who can set people free and show them the truth. He's the only one who can. I can point you to it, but only the Holy Spirit can do it. I'll never forget, Kyle Todd came and talked to me a few weeks after he was born again. And he told me, he said, Pastor, he said, all I can tell you is this. He said, the night that I was saved, he said, the preacher that night said the same thing that every preacher had said my entire life. The message was not different. It was the same gospel message I'd heard my whole life. He said, I heard my pastor preach it growing up. I heard you preach it. That guy was preaching it that night. It was the same message. He said, all I can tell you that night 
it was like the Lord opened my blinded eyes. And I was able to hear it and see it and understand it. And the lights went on. And I got it for the first time. And I walked down that night and surrendered my heart to Jesus. He said, and that night it took, and I've never been the same. He said, and I didn't do anything to make that night different from any other night. God just sovereignly reached down and did the work. And I want to tell you what every preacher hopes for every time he does the foolish task of taking an old dusty book and stepping in front of people and talking way too long about it is he trusts that the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and does the miracle of creating faith in the hearts of people. And somewhere in that mashup of the Word and the Spirit and people receiving and acting on it by faith, the supernatural happens. And people are saved and delivered and changed and set free and rescued and brought out of darkness into light and brought from death to light and brought from error to the truth and brought out of false doctrine into the truth and, and, and set free from all manner of things. And the Lord does it. And all the preacher does is stand at the front and read the book and trust the Holy Spirit to do the miracle that he's dead in the water if he doesn't do. That's it. Sounds like the farmer who just has to plant the seed and wait for the rain and hope for the best, doesn't it? Yeah. Can I tell you tonight, some of you have got loved ones, and I want to encourage you, don't give up on them. Do the same thing. Oh, pastor, I've talked to them about the Lord I'm blue in the face. Don't quit now. You don't know which conversation will be the one. You don't know what night will be the night. You don't know which time. You share God's word with them that the Holy Spirit is going to show up and tap them on the head and the blinders are going to fall off their eyes and faith's going to rise in their heart and they're going to get it for the first time and they're going to go, wait a minute, whoa, I never saw it that way before. Maybe you're right. And the Holy Spirit is going to start doing something and they're going to come and everything's going to change. There are no guarantees. You can't make it happen when you want to any more than the farmer can cause the seed to burst forth out of the ground with new life. But you can do your part. If you can prepare the ground, you can plant the seed, and you can be faithful. And I urge you to do that. Do that with your family this holiday season. Do that with your friends that you're sharing with. Do that with people on your job that you may think aren't paying attention and listening. Don't argue. Don't quarrel. Don't get into some big debate with them and make them mad. But every chance you get, push some gospel seeds down in their heart. Share your testimony. Share the story of Jesus. Share the word of God. And trust the Holy Spirit that he will use it. And when the time is right, the miracle will happen. Amen? Amen. Stand with me tonight, if you will. Anybody else got a comment, an insight on the passage? A question, a comment? All hearts clear. I hope you'll be a gentle servant. I hope you'll be a clean vessel. I hope you'll be an unashamed workman because you learn how to cut the book straight. And I hope that we don't just know the truth, but that we live the truth. Amen? And that we're gentle and humble, yet clear in where we stand, and right down the middle of the book when we preach and teach it. Amen? Remember, there are lines we draw in ink and there are lines we draw in pencil. Don't go de-Christianize somebody over a minor disagreement over a side issue in the Bible that doesn't matter all that much. Don't do it. There are some things that are big enough issues that I understand why we worship in different congregations over them. There are places in the Bible we must make a decision. We're going to do it this way or we're going to do it this way. And we believe this way is more biblical and has more biblical support, so we're going to do it this way. However, if it's not a heaven or hell issue, I don't have to look at my Christian friend who attends a church that chose the other direction on that topic and say they're not Christians. Don't do it. 
be clear on where the lines are. Not every error is a heresy. Not every disagreement is something we have to have a falling out over. Amen? Amen. So whether Jesus comes at the front, the middle, or the back end of the tribulation, just be ready whenever he comes. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together tonight. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love my friends, and I thank you for the people who come week after week just to faithfully hear your word. Father, I pray that you would bless us tonight. I pray that we'd walk out of this place tonight more determined than we've ever been to be faithful, faithful to Christ. Lord, we know our performance isn't perfect, but we pray that our hearts are pure. And if they're not, Lord, would you make them so? Because we understand that not only are we justified by grace through faith, but we're sanctified by grace through faith. So, Lord, if we've not believed you and received that yet, would you bring us even there to a place where our hearts are clean? Lord, I pray tonight that you would make us vessels of honor for Christ who faithfully share the word of God humbly, gently, not argumentative, not cocky, not arrogant, not rude. But, Lord, that we, having humbly received the grace of God, are driven by love for other people. And we share because we love we're not trying to prove ourselves right. We're trying to get people out of the pain and brokenness of their current situation into the life and hope of the gospel. And Lord, may that be evident in our lives. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. As we pray the prayer of David, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen and amen. God bless you. Love you tonight. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Extra couple minutes. You're dismissed. See you Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. Is first service. 10.15 is Sunday school. 11.15 is second service. We'll be honoring our pastoral staff in our second service. Amen. So you can remember that. Have a great night.